This is a guide to drafting your own jacket pattern. It is a very technical step-by-step, -step, one, two, three kind of method. I just feel that this is much more easy to learn than a possibly more practical method that actual tailors use, actual cutters use. As you gain understanding though, other future methods, better methods, will probably come more easily to you. I have a video demonstrating taking the measurements you need, but I also have the measurements I'm using and a set of standard measurements in that you can use in the description. Importantly, in the context of jackets, scale is half of the chest measurement rather than half the seat measurement, as is the case when drafting trousers. I have the basic measurements I need written down as well as the fractions that I need worked out. If you want to work in Imperial, then I suggest you see my video on L squares. The measurements in this video don't perfectly convert, so like I say, just convert to the nearest eighth. I'm still at the stage where I'm largely using lining paper to draft my patterns. It's inexpensive and you can find it at many DIY places though you do need to stick two lengths together in order to use it for drafting a jacket, which is where the masking tape comes in. And I should also mention that it's best to start on the left of the paper rather than the, and work towards the right, rather than the neck being on the right hand side of the page, the way, the way I happen to be doing it in this video. I think it's only because I'm left-handed. Start with a line going the length of the page from right to left, which serves as a preliminary centre-back line. Make sure there are a few centimetres at the right of the paper and mark point zero. We could use the straight edge of the paper, but this is better for showing. From zero, which represents the nape, one is the side depth, 21 centimetres. You could add a centimetre to the depth to give the jacket a bit of ease, but a high armhole is important for proper movement. Then again from the nape, the waist height is 42 centimetres down and is 0.2. From the waist, 0.3, the hip line, is 1 eighth of the height further down, in this case 22.75 centimetres. Then the jacket length from 0 is 75 centimetres and 0.4. And here I label those points 1 to 4. Point 5 is halfway between 0 and 1, and point 6 is halfway between points 0 and 5. Square off all of those points. 5 and 6 only about half that of the rest though. Now we are shaping the back. Measure in 2 or 2.5 two centimetres at point 2, 4.7, and measure in 1.5 to 2 centimetres from point 3, 4.8. This very much depends on a person's shape and stance. Their back may curve in more or less, but these are okay general measurements for practice. This is practically the lumber sport, and I know my back caves a lot, so I will err on the side of a larger scoop. Starting at point 5, chalk the centre back seam through 7 and 8 and straighten it out to the hem past 8. Be sure and check that it's a good natural line and redraw it if needs be. Essentially you want to start from 5 and curve the back outside of the pattern very slightly and then cross to the other side of the line at the halfway point straightening it into 7. From 7, try to bow outside of the pattern, then straightening into the horizontal line. Point 9 is 1 8 scale plus 2 centimetres out from 0, so 7.9 centimetres. Point 10 is 2 centimetres up from there. Join 0 and 10 with a line that will sit across the neck. You don't want it to be too straight because it will push against the neck, the neck will win, and there'll be rumbles in the fabric as it's pushed back. From 10, stay very close to the line for the first centimeter.
4.11 from 0.5 on the centre back go out half the across bike measurement plus a seam allowance. So 19 and a half plus a one centimetre seam allowance and square 11 up and down to lines one and zero. Point 12 is where the line you made crosses the line from point six. Go up another two centimetres for 13 and then forwards away from the centre back two centimetres for point 14. Connect 14 to 10. Chalk a gentle concave shoulder line there, no farther than a few millimetres from the line. Point 15 is where the vertical line at point 11 meets the line below it, line 1. Point 16 is 1 8 scale above 15, then 17 and 18 is half and 1 and a half centimetres out from 16 respectively. So half a centimetre and then a seam allowance. Connect 14, 11 and 17 to make the back armhole. At the top, right near the shoulder, try to keep the line at about a right angle to the shoulder line. Otherwise, the shoulders might join and make a pointed end sticking out. So at the top, don't scoop it out too much. Point 19 is two centimeters towards the center back from 15. Square that all the way down to the hem. Point 20 is where that line intersects with the seat line, the one from point three. From point 20, go out one centimeter to shape the side seam. For the side seam, join 18, the point that the line from 19 intersects the waistline, and 20, but you do best not to infringe on point 15. Shape the side seam now, join the points with straight lines as a guide, and starting at 18, chalk the bowed line outside of the pattern, straightening as you hit the waist, bowing slightly into the pattern, about halfway along the, the line, curving outside of the pattern and straightening into point 20. From point 15, measure one quarter scale plus four and a half centimeters, so 16.4 centimeters for point 21 and then measure one half scale minus two and a half centimeters, so 21.3 centimeters for point Square off at point 22 and make sure that the lines from 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4 intersect with it. For 23, from 21, measure towards 22, 1 8 scale plus 4 centimeters, 9.9 .9 centimeters in this case. Square it up to the top line, which is 24 and our front neck point. Connect 24 and 12. For 25, you need to measure the shoulder width on the back pattern. Take one centimeter from that measurement because the back needs ease and mark that length from 24 as 25. Then 26 is one centimeter vertically down from here. Connect 26 and 24 in a slightly convex line, which of course will be married to the concave line on the back. I do neither of these things here, I accidentally connect 24 and 25 in another concave curve, but I realize half my mistake as I'm cutting it out later. Point 27 is 2 centimeters up from point 21, and point 28 is another centimeter out from point 18. Those will save for later. From 24, 29 is 1 8 scale down the pattern, which is the gorge depth. 
Point 30 is half a centimeter towards you from 29. Connect 24 and 30, and then draw a right angle line from that line at point 30, extending beyond the current center front line. This creates a guideline for the gorge line and the top of the lapel. Point 31 is 3 centimeters towards the center front from 24. The 3 centimeters is what I want the color stand to be. Points 32 and 33 are where the waist and hip line from 2 and 3 hit the front. Then, for 34 and 35, you need to measure the widths of your back pattern at those heights. So along the waist construction line, measure the distance between your centre back and the side seam. With these measurements, it may be around 16.1 centimetres. Similarly, I want the seat across the back, 17.9 centimetres. Then I take half my waist and seat measures being 37.2 and 46 centimetres. To the waist, I want to add 8 centimetres for space and shape, and then take away the measurement from the back, this time being 29.1 centimetres. Very similarly on the seat, except I add 5 centimetres for space and seams and stuff, giving me 33.1 centimetres. I take this measurement from the waist and seat and measure them from the center front line back towards the back pattern, giving me points 34 and 35. And I suggest we chalk out the side seam now, starting by joining our points with straight lines and from 35 at the seat we draw a line straight down to the hem. So joining points 18, 34 and 35. Yes, 18, not 28. Start by bowing slightly outside of the pattern and curving back into it about halfway along the first line we drew, straightening as we get to the waist bowing into the pattern slightly before curving back outside of the pattern about halfway along the line, straightening towards the horizontal line to the hem. What is very important to know about this is that the balance of my side seams with my body measurements are way off. The side seam on the jacket front is way longer than the side seam on the back. If you use the standard measurements I give you in the description, you shouldn't encounter this problem. If you use mine or your own measurements and get an issue like this, I show how I correct the balance of the seams in a very simple way before I cut out the two pieces later. Point 36 is where the center front line hits the hemline. 37 is then two centimeters lower than that. Connect 37 to the bottom of your front pattern's side seam. 38 is 1.8 centimeters further out from 32, and you can connect that to 37. I accidentally made it straight here, but connecting it to 37 will give you a much better front edge shape. This will be where our front edge is going to be. There will not be a seam allowance here. We will add extra cloth when we cut out, mark stitch, and then sew along it. It's very common to have templates to draw on a curve at the bottom. It's a style choice. I just use my ruler here, but I exaggerate the curve a little before I cut it. Point 39 is two and a half centimeters towards 23 from 21. Square all the way down to the hem, which makes 40. And I've forgotten to mark 30 ages now. Measure 39 to 40, half it and take away one and mark it on the same line from 40 as 41. I think I accidentally added a centimeter, but you're supposed to take it away. Then you'll need a parallel line to that one to measure the same length from another point on the hem. Connect your new point to 41 and that will be your pocket line. It's slanted so that it's parallel to the hem and appears straight when the pattern is put on the fabric. Centered on 41, measure 16 centimeters, eight either side for the size of the pocket. 
This can absolutely be changed to suit you, but this is a good rule for now. I mark a vertical line down from the front and a parallel line 6cm from the pocket line to illustrate the flap. From 21 again, 42 is 4cm towards the back. Square it down to the waistline for 43. This will be a dart. Measure 0.75cm and 1.5cm towards the centre front on the waistline from the intersecting point. Then again from 42 measure through the second point on the waist down to the pocket which makes the centre of the dart. Then again from 42 connect to the third point then from 43 and the third point go to where the middle line hits the pocket. Now chalk on the front armhole. Put simply, it's a line from 28 hitting 42 and 27 and ending on 26. You just need to make it a nice, natural, almost egg shape. Like with the back armhole, we need to be sure that it's more of a right angle near the shoulder line. So again, not scooping out too much from the first three to four centimeters below the shoulder. This is, this is something else that often varies with cutters. Point 27 here is more of a guide. The armhole can be cut through if it needs to be. The armhole line can cut through it if needs be rather than just glancing it. Having placed the armhole, there's the breast pocket and you need to find the furthest out point of your armhole. In this case, it's in line with point 21, otherwise mark it onto the sign line. Then four centimeters ahead of that is where the pocket will start. Mark about half a centimeter up on the shoulder side, measure the width of the pocket, about 10 or 11 centimeters is a good length, and find that on the side line. Join these points and square both of these points up against the side line. Mark two and a half centimeters above the first line to create the rhombus. For the front dart, find one centimeter towards the side seam from the front of the front pocket and carry it on up to the side line. Then find seven centimeters below the side on that line. Then on the waist, mark half centimeter either side of your line and connect your four points. Forty-four is one centimeter above point thirty-eight and is the start of the brake line. Because we don't want the lapel to start exactly where the button is, connect forty-four to thirty-one. Then immediately we need the neck gorge line. So from the neck point, point twenty-four, make a line parallel to the brake line, intersecting the line that we drew as the preliminary gorge line. We don't even necessarily need to curve them together, but we can. A good lapel width is 8cm, so we'll find where 8cm at right angles to the brake line we just drew hits the line we drew from point 30. Connect the end of the 8cm line you drew to point 44, which will be the shape of the lapel. Either a straight line, or give it a bit of a belly. We need the front pitch from the line we used to find the frontmost point of the armhole curve and where it hits the side line, draw out a 45 degree line. And that's just the front pitch. We already know the back pitch, it's 0.11 on the armhole. Like I mentioned, the balance of the side seams needs to be fixed. This is a problem you may encounter when drafting with the system I laid out using your own measurements. As you can see, the length of the side seam on the fore part is much longer than the side seam on the back. We just need them to be even so that they can be sewn together properly. To correct the seams, we need to know how off balance they are, hence I am making a straight line between the balance points on the side seams of the front and back pieces. I am measuring from this line to the side seam at the waist. The distance between my line and the side seam on my forepart is 5cm 
and two centimeters on the back. Basically, I need to make them both equal to make the seams more balanced, making both seams the same length. What is also important is that the overall circumference of the waist remains about the same. We shouldn't ever change the center back seam because it is the shape of the person's back. It cannot be used to make alterations unless the person is different or the entire seam is moved apart equally. To start, I increase the size of the underarm dart a total of one centimeter, moving the line half a centimeter either side and redrawing it. This means I can move the four part side seam out one centimeter and making it one centimeter closer to the back pattern seam side. So now the difference is two centimeters, so I'm able to add one centimeter to the front side seam and take away one centimeter from the back side seam. Now it's a case of redrawing the side seams, though as much the same principle as I did the first time. As I'm drawing, I want to make the top of the seams just about on top of one another to make them more easy to sew together, only the top few centimeters. Now the seams are better balanced and can be put together properly. Cut out the pattern. I've shown the whole thing just so that I'm explicit in showing that the seam steps and such like are cut the way they are. We don't need to draw on the buttons. We've used standard measurements today and we know where they'll need to go on the jacket. Here is where I half correct the front shoulder to the correct point, but I still cut it in a concave line. It's supposed to go outside of the pattern. And I also suggest cutting notches into the various balance points.
For the sleeves, to begin with, measure the sizes of the top sleeve and under sleeve. We measure one centimeter from the edge of the pattern. So I start from the back pitch and measure towards the shoulder. I take that measurement and put it onto the front pitch and measure up to the shoulder again. I write this down as the top sleeve. Then again, from the front pitch, I measure down the armhole to the side seam. Then again, I apply that measurement starting at the seam step up to the back pitch. This is the measure for the undersleeve. We add these together for the total armhole size because this is our scale this time. The whole armhole measurement is scale, and from there we need half scale, quarter scale, third scale, and one sixth scale. Start with a horizontal line with zero near the right of the page, leaving a fair few centimeters above it. Measure one quarter scale left along our line for one. Make a right angled line from zero, a non specific length, but at least half scale. From point one, measure one half scale diagonally to our second line for point two. Make a horizontal line down the paper from point two. Make a straight vertical line from one to our second line for point three. Along the diagonal line, divide the length by three and make two equidistant points on it as four and five. This is the same as one sixth scale between each point. From line one to three, square right through points four and five. From where line five intersects line one to three, measure up one third scale plus one centimeter towards the crown. Mark as six. Square off the top, intersecting our top and bottom lines for seven and eight, respectively. Point nine is halfway between seven and eight, and then ten is halfway between nine and eight. Give both of these horizontal lines as well. Where the line we drew from 10 intersects line 0 to 2, measure 2 centimeters towards the crown for 10b, which is a guide for the curve. From the diagonal line, make a line at right angles intersecting point 9, and another line from where the horizontal line from point 9 intersects the diagonal line. From point 2, I am applying half the across back measurement, so I'm finding 19.5 on this tape measure. I place this point onto point 2 to measure along the elbow for point 11, and then to the cuff for point 12. With a tape measure or sufficiently long ruler, take the same measurement from 2 and pivot it to our first line for 13. Join 12 and 13. From 13, take half our cuff measurement and add 2 centimeters. Measure towards 12 for 14. 15 is halfway between 1 and 13. Measure 2 centimeters up and join that being 15a to 13 and 1. From 11, on the horizontal, make a vertical line to line 2 to 14 and from there, measure either 2 centimeters or 4 centimeters as a guide for the armhole curve. Now we're shaping the sleeve, so the forearm seam, creating a gentle curve between 13, 15a, and 1. Then for the hindarm seam, 0.2 to 11 to 14. When shaping the hindarm, I have a habit of making it pointed at the elbow. This is my preference as a form following function, but it looks wrong, so shape the hind arm as it pleases you. For the crown, from 1, closely follow the guideline until 10b before curving towards 9, then almost straight to 6, bowing outward slightly, then following the guideline to point 2. 
but bowing more significantly this time. To shape the undersleeve, from point 1 again, measure 1 sixth scale plus 2 centimeters for point A. Lightly mark a guideline through point 5 on the diagonal. To check the measurements, from here we will begin walking the tape measure from point 2 around the crown of the sleeve. Take the measurement at 1 and take off 2 centimeters. Shaping the undersleeve, mark 1 centimeter from point 1 on the top sleeve line as seam allowance and draw a curve downwards to where 10 hits line 1 to 3, curving up to follow the guideline we drew. From here, begin walking the tape measure from point 2 around the crown of the sleeve. Take the measurement at 1 and take off 2 centimeters, applying it to the underarm and continue walking with the tape measure. We need the total of the armhole measurement plus 10%. This point will be on the guideline and needs to be above the line 0 to 2. If it doesn't get high enough, we need to slightly redraw the curvy parts of our top sleeve to make it shorter and re-measure. When you have the armhole measurement plus 10% at line 0 to 2, mark 1 cm seam allowance towards point 2. Join this point into the top sleeve's hindarm seam, joining the two seams at about the elbow. And this is the undersleeve and top sleeve pattern done, and you could cut them out at this point. For posterity, I'm giving this sleeve a false forearm. I'm going to move the forearm seam by 2 cm so that it's moved further towards the underside of the sleeve, becoming more subtle. Measure several points 1 cm either side of the shorter seam, the forearm seam. Create two new identical lines either side of the original. Join the inside one up to the undersleeve. Carry on the outer one up slightly. Continue the run of the top sleeve, mirroring the run of the undersleeve as accurately as possible until it hits the 1 cm line. Then cut it out basically the same as you would anyway, ignoring the original middle line. The two basic ways of getting the undersleeve out from the top sleeve pattern is to trace the top sleeve onto some new paper and cut the undersleeve out of the original. Or the other way is to use a tracing wheel or do something to trace the undersleeve onto some new paper and cut that out. Since I have the false forearm, I need to copy the forearm seam 2 cm into the pattern, and I can just move my top sleeve and use it as a ruler to draw that line rather than tracing wheel it. Either way, it's important to copy off the horizontal line across the top of the sleeve.
Since I'm tracing a new undersleeve, I can use the original hindarm seam from the top of the seam of the new undersleeve pattern to copy the seam to the cuff. For the collar, I want to measure from the centre back of the shoulder seam along the neckline. Usually we just write that down on the neck. Slip some paper underneath the front pattern at the top of the lapel. Follow the line 44 to 31, or the break line, up onto the paper as well. The point that the line on the new paper starts is 1. Square across your line at the shoulder line, that is point 2. Continue up from 2, the length of your back neck, minus 2 centimeters for seam allowance, for point 3. Square off the top a little towards you and mark the point 0.75 centimeters on that line. This is 4. Connect 4 and 1. Square 1 to 4 and mark 3 centimeters, the length of the collar stand, towards yourself. 4.5 and 4 centimeters away 4.6. Mark 3 centimeters below the break line at the shoulder, joining the previous line and this one down to below the bottom of the lapel. Mark 4.5 centimeters above the break line and join this up to the 4 centimeter line at the center back. To shape the notch, I want to trace off the whole lapel. With the 8-ish centimeter lapel, I want the notch to start 4 centimeters from the edge of the lapel. It needs to be closer to the notch than the break line. I want to make two sides of an equilateral triangle with a notch. I need the measurement between the notch and the edge of the lapel being 4 centimeters. So I'm measuring 4 centimeters up from the peak of the lapel from the tip and the notch to the same point. Might be easier with a compass, but you can see that I've created a fair triangle. I'm curving, I'm joining the four centimeter line from the shoulder line to the near edge of the triangle in a curve. Now we add inlay to the collar. Add one or two centimeters below the lapel line in a straight line. In front of the notch on the lapel, add three centimeters. Along the top of the collar, add two and a half centimeters. On the center back, add one centimeter, basically a seam allowance. Cut out the collar. We can fold the pattern along the break line to illustrate the break line. It's folded in about a curve. I'm labeling the stand and the other side is the fold, and then I'm just hatching the inlay just to illustrate what is extra. Lining up the break line to the break line of the jacket, we can see how it fits together. Flipping it over, we can put the stands together as well. When we cut the jacket, there will be fabric added beyond the neckline and that we will just lay the stand onto. It doesn't quite translate trying to put all three pieces together. Usually the pattern for cutting the collar can be generic because of all the inlay. It can be used to the specs of almost any given jacket. 
but I have no way to communicate it, so we'll make this one. That said, with the inlay, you can likely use the same one for most of your jackets. And now I want to fold the pieces in half with one crisp fold, leveling the highest and lowest points. A good size hole is about 15 millimeters across the fold so that it can be hung in a pattern hook. Each piece needs to only realistically have a name and a date so that they don't get mixed up. Day, day, month, month, year, year is good, though maybe year, 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 year for some since Anderson and Shepard apparently have patterns dating back to the 19th century. This is just so that you can, if you make alterations, you know which is the most recent pattern and which is most likely correct. <laughs> 